it can be love of the aliens. Use it, senor! Oh! Oh, the Holy Virgin Blavatskaya! And we have a very important mission here in Peru. Then a subtitle calls him Leandro Rivera, while the host introduces him as Leandro Benedicto Rivera. We were supposed to see one of the most important discoveries of the 21st century. That the humanoid mummies from Nazca are just a simple fake. The mysterious Nazca mummies. What are they? Ancient aliens? A mixed breed of aliens and humans? An extinct race of ancient gods unknown to science? Or is this just a hoax? But can a hoax be of such a massive scale? In the last episode, we got to know some people from Peru and Russia who were involved in this story. We also found out that there's a mass production of fake antiquities in South America. We have learned that the amazing Nazca mummies have been researched with X-rays, CD scans, histology and genetic analysis, as well as carbon dating. The results of this extensive research are available on thealienproject.com. All the evidence seems to indicate that these amazing finds are genuine. Let's analyze these materials one by one. The X-ray imagery was the first evidence alien researchers used to claim the authenticity of the mummies. The X-rays are brandished in a video on the official mummy research project. But for reasons unknown, mummy enthusiast Konstantin Korotkov is rather critical of these X-rays in his book. On page 79, he writes, quote, It's next to impossible to come to any conclusions based on the X-rays, so we rely on the CT analysis instead, end of quote. He was just as skeptical in his correspondence with me when I'd sent him the results of our X-ray expert analysis. He wrote to me, quote, The X-rays are not sufficient for any sound conclusions, end of quote. Why this sudden about-face? Unbelievable! This X-ray proves without a shade of doubt that the mummies are genuine! In your face, official science! Nothing beats the X-rays! What's this? A report by the anthropogenists' experts? A crude... Fake? The X-ray is nonsense. You can't make any conclusions based on that. But we will study those X-rays anyway. Anthropologist Stanislav Drobyshevsky and paleontologist Alexei Bondarev have offered their expert opinions. Among all the weird mummies, there are four three-fingered hands. These hands were among the first finds that Mario shared with alien enthusiasts in late 2016. Let's have a look at the first hand. For those of you who may not know, the human hand contains metacarpal bones that form the palm of our hand. The hand also consists of phalanges that form our fingers and thumbs. The mummy's fingers consist of human metacarpals and phalanges mixed together. Wait! What's that? Is this a metatarsal bone? It's a midfoot bone. It's followed by a phalange, then a metacarpal, then again by phalanges. Let's look at the articulation joints now. Look at this x-ray of a real human hand. The bones are fitted snugly to each other, arches to concaves, with few clearances. Otherwise, you'd have difficulty moving your hand. The so-called alien mummy's hand is all messed up. Concaves join concaves at random. And what's inside the hand? Very few joints, just a mess of stumps. And why is a human ulna there, the wrong way around, with its point facing the fingers? Let's examine the second hand now. Things look much better here. Inside the hand, we spot a tibia or shin bone, two metacarpals hanging loosely, some phalanges and other mishmash. Finally, his hand number three. 
looks even better. But the fingers are still a puzzling mix of hand and foot bones. Inside the wrist, we can make out two humeri or upper arm bones, two elni and one tibia that all seem to have belonged to a child. Amongst these, we suddenly find a border vertebra. Why on earth does it have to be here? Well, just because. Let's now look at all the hands together. You get an impression that their creator was gaining experience with each subsequent hand. The first hand was a complete flop, but the forger was learning from their mistakes. But if these hands belong to creatures of one and the same species, then why are they so versatile? Look at hands of different apes. They may seem to have little similarity, but they always follow a single plan. And here we only see a total hodgepodge of stuff. The official MAMI website says the hands are made up of 26 bones each. I counted them up, left to right, 31, 27, 24 and 26 bones. You can check yourselves. It's a miracle of bioengineering! A bionic Lego set that uses homeotic genes. The Atlanteans were capable of creating any biorobotic servants they wished, ignoring the laws of biomechanics. I have a simpler explanation. Someone who created these was little bothered by biomechanics or anatomy. Their goal was to imitate the outer shape. So they just grabbed whichever bones fitted in size and covered them with some substance to imitate flesh. Now let's study the X-rays of the small mummies. Ufologists go as far as calling them humanoid reptiles. So what do we see? Same stuff. A hodgepodge of human and animal bones. Here's a mummy named Josephine. A real beauty. Instead of humor eyes, she sports femurs or thigh bones. Her legs are even more baffling. One of the thigh bones is actually a femur, only facing the wrong way around, while the other one is a tibia. And they are completely mismatched. With the hip bone, there's no joint there at all. The poor humanoid wouldn't have made a single step. Some of the bones are simply chopped off. Note this asymmetry here. The fingers are a total mess, too. The first pseudophalanges are facing in different directions on her left and right hands, with the white part facing up or down. Well, they just forgot to turn them the right way. Stuff happens. And look at this alien head. French paleontologist Julien Benoit thinks that those who crafted the small humanoid mummies used skulls of some small mammals for their heads, such as a llama or alpaca. Comparison shows that the reptiloid's cranial cavity fits perfectly the cranial cavity of a llama. The location of the olfactory bulbs, the inner ear, the brain hemispheres and the cerebellum precisely matches those in a llama skull. The whole facial part of the skull was broken off, leaving only the brain case. The skull was then rotated, so its back part faces forward. The reptiloid's face is actually the back of the poor llama's head. Paleontologist Rodolfo Salas Gismondi is of the same opinion. Where could the mummy forges have gotten a llama skull? Historian Yuri Bereskin has told me that pre-Columbian peoples of Peru often made llama burials. Here's a fresh report about finding buried llama mummies in Peru. Paleontologist Alexei Bondarev has examined a photograph depicting the base of the skull of one of the mummies, from which the skin had been lifted. See this unusual square foramen magnum, the alleged place of the junction of the brain and the spinal cord. You can clearly see how the so-called skin goes inside the square hole with no tearing. It's as if a human neck went right inside the hole in the back of their skull. You can make a doll like this, but it's simply impossible to find in a real mummy of any creature, be it of a humanoid or reptiloid kind. Master, where do we attach the backbone? What? 
onto the forehead? How many times should I tell you? This creature has no analogs in terrestrial fauna. Do as you're told. You can read about Alexei Bondarev's reasoning in more detail by following a link in the description to this video. Alexei did more than that. At one of the Scientists Against Myths events, he retaliated the Nazca aliens by showing the mummy of an Omsk penguinoid. He used seagull and rabbit bones covered with toy clay to create a picture-perfect mummy. His skills in anatomy helped Alexei choose the right bones to make working joints and hip bone. This is what sets the penguinoid apart from the so-called Nazca mummies. Of course, we don't plan to fool people with this mummy. But just imagine what a sensation it could make. New loot has just arrived. Sensational discovery by Siberian diggers. Intelligent marsupial penguinoid dryoping Venus Nanus from um, the era of... Um, what's he called? Asgardus Darius. My Siberian mates have stumbled on this during construction of the Palenque metro lines. Don't touch it! It's radioactive! What's your price, senor? Okay, we've examined the X-rays, but X-rays so old school. We've got a brand new examination technology today called CT or computer tomography. This is what Kortkov writes about it in his book on page 41. Quote, it is no longer enough to simply look at ancient bones. To understand the peculiarities of images on high-resolution computer tomograms and be able to interpret them requires a great deal of clinical experience. This can be done by doctors, who study such images every day. But anthropologists usually do not have this knowledge." End of quote. This must have been the reason why no anthropologists were invited to join the mummy research team. Luckily, we did find one such expert. This is anthropologist Sergei Slepchenko from the Laboratory of Anthropology and Ethnology at the Institute of the Problems of Assimilation of the North of the Siberian Subdivision of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Sergei has studied mummies of the far north of Russia and has studied CT scans of ancient mummies. I asked Sergei to look at the CT scans of the Nazca mummies known as Albert and Josephine. Surprisingly, Sergei came to the same conclusion as his colleagues, though he knew nothing about their examination results. Quote, According to my analysis of the CTs in question, the objects Albert and Josephine are not skeletons of any real animals, but our handiwork that was made using human bones. End of quote. The anthropologist noted that in both Albert and Josephine, thigh bones were used instead of humeri or upper arm bones. Albert had a humerus in place of one thigh bone and a thigh bone in place of the other shin bone. The expert had noticed that the mummy's backbone is composed of broken vertebrae and ribs that often go inside the spinal canal. Slepchenko noted low quality of the tomograms. He also pointed that something was stuffed inside Albert's neck vertebrae, likely some bone or stick to keep the head upright. Look closer, there's some kind of stuff inside the spinal canal that is absent in the foramen magnum. Then it appears in the vertebral foramen of the first vertebra and goes on down through the whole cervical spine. In the lower part of the neck vertebrae, this stuff spreads to almost the whole width of the neck, but it can't be found in the thoracic spine. French paleontologist Julien Benoit also notes this stuff inside Josephine's neck. You can read Sergei Slepchenko's expert conclusions in the extra materials in the description to this video. And here is a comparison of the CT scan of Josephine's skull with a llama skull made by our friends from Peru. In actual fact, the first reptiloid mummies didn't look that good. 
They had been preceded by several prototypes which were so poorly crafted that even ufologists dismissed them as fakes. Look at these poor victims of an amateur taxidermist. Look at this little Frankenstein. A real beauty, isn't it? The neck is a total masterpiece. Instead of vertebrae, it's made of a whole tubular bone. Although photos of these monsters were initially featured in Mami articles, you won't find a single mention of them on the alienproject.com. Mami enthusiasts divide these mummies into two types. We have already examined the small so-called humanoid mummies. The other type is three-fingered humans. Maria, the most publicized mummy, belongs to that type. Basically, Maria looks pretty human, but her skull is elongated, she has no ears, her eyes are too big, and, most importantly, she's got three fingers in each hand and three toes in each foot. Actually, her skull shape is nothing unique. Pre-Columbian communities in Peru practice artificial cranial or skull deformation. The ears might have been cut off to create a more plausible alien visage. Some whitish substance, possibly tellurine, was used as makeup. Our Peruvian colleague Luca has found traces of some tool on the mummy that resemble those left by a brush. Ancient Nazca mummies have been known to archaeologists for a long time. I mean actual mummies of real five-fingered ancient humans. Hundreds of mummies of the pre-Columbian Chachapoya culture have been found. The pre-Columbians used special techniques to preserve the body before burial. Thanks to the dry climate of coastal Peru, human remains were well preserved. A lot of these mummies can be seen in museums. Here they are on display at the Lema Bamba Museum. Look at the way they're crouched. We've seen this before. The grave diggers may have gotten one of these mummies for themselves. But the fingers were a bit too many, so they just chop off a few, thanks paleontologist Rodolfo Salas Gismondi of the New York Museum of Natural History. Maria lost her thumbs and pinkies. Then some flesh on the palms of her hands was shaved off to make the remaining fingers look longer. Salas Gismondi shows this on an X-ray of a real human hand. Paleontologist Julien Benoit has noticed another interesting detail on Maria's CT. He has counted five sinews of her right hand extension muscles. Here is the thumb sinew while the thumb is gone. There's one more little detail. If you cut a fresh sinew, it shrinks. But if a dry mummified sinew is cut that is no longer elastic, it stays in place after the cutting, and this is what it will look like. And that's exactly what we see here. The thumb was cut off after the mummification. The forgers used the same technique on the mummy's feet. Without her big toes and foot arches that work as rigid support for human legs, the mummy would have been unable to walk without difficulty. The X-rays show tinkering with the foot arches. Anthropologist Stanislav Drobyshevsky noticed that back in 2017. Here's the X-ray of one of Maria's feet. Compare it to the structure of a real human's foot. I'm not going into too much detail here. Just look at how tightly foot bones are pressed to one another in a human foot. And now look at the mummy's foot. See this big gap between her tarsal bones and the three metatarsal bones? Where are her articulation joints? There are simply none there. Hang on! A human being has three phalanges in each finger. One, two, three. Maria has five in both her fingers and toes. We already know that Peruvian forgers show great skills in hand reconstruction. Let's have another look at the feet hex race. Flavio Estrada Moreno, criminal forensics expert from the Peruvian Institute of Forensics, examined Maria's feet hex race and spotted finger bones in them. But does it really matter what bones to use to make the mummy if the poor wretch will never walk again? I also want to talk about another Nazca mummy called Pavita. This is a young child's mummy. It's featured on the Alien Project website and is mentioned in Korotkov's publications and the book. It's got three fingers in each hand and three toes on each foot. But the extra fingers and toes were so crudely removed that even mummy enthusiasts noticed that. Korotkov says in his book, quote, there are signs of removal of fingers, end of quote. Dentist Dmitry Galetsky, one of the Russian amateur mummy experts, says in an interview, quote, 
Its fingers and toes were simply torn off. Originally, it had five fingers and then someone tore them off or bit them off, end of quote. So the fingers and the toes were bitten off. I guess biting off fingers and toes should have raised red flags, even for the most gullible ufologist, and should have given them second thoughts about the origins of another mummy that also lacks two fingers on its hands and two toes on its feet. I can't stress this enough. Someone chopped off the child mummy's fingers and toes. Dear ufologists, shouldn't this give you some food for thought? Nope. At least this fact is not commented in any of the ufological publications that I have studied. What you're saying is nonsense. Yes, bones can be faked, but tissue structure cannot. How can you fake the DNA? We have histological and genetic data to back that. It's a serious argument. Luckily, we can also use histologists and geneticists' help including the geneticists who have analyzed mummies before. Together, we'll try to work out what we can learn from Nazca mummy tissue examination. We'll talk about this in the next part of our investigation. Do you want the next video to come out faster? Then please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if you wish to give us your serious support, please subscribe to our page on Patreon. I'm Alexander Sokolov. See you next time!